Hello everyone, welcome to The Whisperer in Darkness. This is based on the story, The Whisperer in Darkness, by H.P. Lovecraft. And as it says here, it was made in seven days for the public domain jam. So this game itself is released into the public domain, it's a pay-what-you-want sort of thing. And along with the game, you can also grab the assets that make it up, and you can also grab the source code, so if you want to muck around in the source code and kind of look at how the whole thing was put together, then go ahead. I'll have links to all of this stuff in the description. Alright, if you're unfamiliar with H.P. Lovecraft, let's just say you're in for a creepy time. This is definitely going to be a very... strange tale. So, let's begin. Chapter 1. To begin with, I must admit I cannot prove the truth of my story. The police found no more evidence to corroborate my report than the bullet holes in the Akeley farmhouse. Nothing remained to suggest that anyone had ever been there other than the missing Akeley himself. Perhaps it was simply a mental shock which caused me to flee the farmhouse that night. Recklessly driving a stolen Ford through the wild hills of Vermont. I can only testify to the vividness of the things I saw and heard and do my best to recreate here the content of my detailed communications with Henry Akeley, which were all lost. I write to you here, on paper, because as you will learn, my electronic communications are surely being watched. Yet I must attempt to spread my story in warning to other foolish adventurers, that I might convince them to avoid those godforsaken hills at all costs. The matter came to my attention several weeks ago because of the recent floods in Vermont. Eccentric dwellers of the hills reported discovering strange bodies washed up on the shore of the West River beyond Newfane. The rumors sparked a surge of theories. Myths and legends began to resurface from decades past. Some of the more well-researched claims were actually printed, sparking popular discussion and debate. The Rutland Herald, Eli Devonport. Bizarre tales of elder race may carry some truth. Vermont folklore, for centuries, has hinted at the existence of a hidden race of monstrous beings somewhere among its most remote hills. Talk of these creatures has since resurfaced, after evidence of their presence was reported by Vermont locals venturing deeper than usual into the mountains. They claim to have seen claw prints in mud, Curiously arranged stone circles where the grass was worn away. Cave mouths closed by boulders in a scarcely accidental fashion. Even dim figures glimpsed in the forest at night. With this evidence taken in addition to the claims of alien bodies washed up on the river beds, it can hardly be denied that something strange is at work in the hills of Vermont. What is most surprising about the recent reports is how well they coincided with a largely forgotten mythology. Both described the creatures as a sort of huge, light red crab with many pairs of legs and with two great bat-like wings in the middle of the back. Could these reports be describing the old ones of legend? As a professor and folklorist, I was already well aware of the legends and my opinions on the subject became increasingly sought after by my students. The roots of legend spread deeply. I found records of centuries-old Penacook mythology referring to the winged ones who came from the sky and had mines in our earthly hills. There they gathered a kind of stone unique to our planet and flew back to their own stars. They were mostly content to leave humans alone, but sometimes men inexplicably disappeared amongst their hills. Their hills, and the deep woods of the highest peaks, and the dark valleys where streams trickle from unknown sources. Their hills, where, in the dead of night, sometimes strange buzzing voices could be heard in conversation seemingly imitating human speech. None of it was to be believed, of course.
Eventually, I decided to take my expertise and rational skepticism to the papers to see if I could quell the nonsense once and for all. I wish I never had. Albert Wilmarth. Facts behind the Mego legend. Lately, particular public attention has been given to the tales of strange events surrounding the hills of Vermont. As an assistant professor of Miskatonic University and a scholar of folklore, I intend to inform you of the mythological origin of these stories and to dispel the irrational fear of these hills. The common name applied to the aliens supposedly lurking in Vermont is the Old Ones. The Puritans identified them as beasts of the devil. Celtic legends from the, from the Scotch-Irish of New Hampshire link them with the evil fairies and little people of the swamps. The most fantastic theories come from tribal legend. The Penacook spoke of winged ones from the great bear in the sky. These winged ones rarely harmed earthly beings, but were instinctually feared by forest animals. What is certain about both the ancient myths and the recent tale is that there is not a grain of truth to either of them. The Vermont myths are essentially no different from the universal legends which filled the ancient world with fauns, dryads, and satyrs. Akeley's first message came in the form of an email one morning. Oh yeah, this game apparently has little sections where you can actually move around. Let's go to my computer. <laughs> it sounds like I'm dragging my entire body behind me. <laughs> I can make it there, I believe. No, it's pretty cool, though. Alright. Oh, it's from Zmail. Mr. Wilmerth. I have read your summaries of Vermont folklore in the Brattleboro Reformer and was impressed by the depth of your research. It is easy to see why you chose to dismiss these supernatural tales. Unfortunately, for reasons I will explain, I'm afraid your opponents, ignorant as they are, may be closer to the truth. My name is Henry Akeley. I have lived my entire life in the midst of the dreaded hills and forests. Of late, I have explored deeper into the uninhabited hills and valleys, and I have come to regret my curiosity, for I now have certain unsettling evidence of the monstrous subjects of my investigation. I do not intend, in writing to you, to spark any argument. My real wish is that you will hush the matter to the best of your ability. These things are dangerous, and they are watching me. Please, share this message with no one. If you wish to see the evidence I have collected, I will send it to you as soon as I can. I have taken several photographs of things I discovered in the woods. My reply was short, no more than a paragraph. I requested he send me his evidence, out of simple curiosity. I would certainly be interested in seeing your photograph. Photographs, rest assured, I do not intend to further involve myself in any public debate over the matter. There we go, sending. And sent. He sent the photos the next day. After viewing them one by one, I couldn't help but begin to entertain the notion that something truly unusual was taking place near the Akeley farmhouse. One night, while I wandered in the woods, I heard the sound of distant ritual chanting. I followed the noise close enough to realize it would be foolish to come any closer to it. I set out the next morning to return to that spot where I found this stone circle. I don't know what to make of it. This is one of the prints you can make out around the circle in the other photo. At the same spot, I found this strange black stone. It's covered in hieroglyphics, but not from any human language. I've been working to decipher them for almost a week. The last photo was of Akeley himself, standing alone in front of the farmhouse. I never wrote to the papers again, 
Slowly, the debates died off. In addition to the black stone, Akeley had one more tangible piece of evidence. He actually managed to record a minute or two of what he had described as ritual chanting, which he heard one night in the woods. He sent me the recording by mail in the form of a tape cassette. I will never forget what I heard when I played the recording or how deeply it affected me. Is the Lord of the Woods, even two, from the wells of night to the gulfs of space, and from the gulfs of space to the wells of night, over the praises of great Cthulhu? And it has come to pass that the Lord of the Woods, being seven and nine, down the onyx steps, tributes to him in the gulf, Azathoth, he of whom thou hast taught us marvels. On the wings of night, out beyond space, out beyond. Go out among men and find the ways thereof, that he in the gulf may know. And he shall put on the semblance of men, the waxen mask in the robe that hides. Next was the matter of the black stone. After puzzling over its hieroglyphics for weeks, Ickley believed he was on the cusp of unraveling its secrets. We agreed that if he could send it to me safely, I might be able to find the last crucial piece needed to translate the glyphs. I managed to convince him to drive into Townshend and ship the stone from there. Its estimated date of arrival came and went, and to my dismay, I received no delivery. Distraught, Akeley concluded the stone must have been intercepted in delivery. Now they must be watching him more closely than ever, he realized. I reassured him that it must simply have been an accident. I prompted him to investigate the status of his delivery. Vermont Postal Service Delivery Tracker. Date and time. Okay. Error, error, error. Hmm. Let's see. On UPS vehicle for delivery at about 2 p.m. In New Fane. Vermont. And then, error. The results were unhelpful. Despite my half-hearted half -hearted encouragements, Akeley soon abandoned hope that the stone would ever be recovered. At this point, Akeley's emails began to arrive with greater frequency, and describing still more horrifying events at the farmhouse. The unknown things had begun to close in on me with a frightening new degree of determination. I suspect they mean to kill me because of our correspondence, and because I now know too much. I never should have sent you that tape cassette, or the black stone. They may now be watching you as well. Be vigilant. I have long known they keep human allies to act as agents and spies. You yourself heard the human voices in the ritual chanting. Now, I believe I have identified one of their human agents. Walter Brown, a surly farmer who lives alone on a run-down hillside place near the deep woods. I have heard his voice in terrible conversations in the woods. I have also seen claw prints near his house. I have never encountered a hint of their presence on nights when the moon is full and bright, for these creatures shun the light. The nocturnal barking of my dogs has grown hideous on moonless nights. Mm. 
Yesterday, on my way to the village by car, I was stopped by a tree trunk laid in my path at a deep patch of the woods. Luckily, I had two of my great dogs with me, whose savage barking warned me of the things which must have been lurking near. I never, I never leave home without my dogs now. Who knows what would have happened if I had been alone. The next email came in the evening, and I judged it was written in a hurry. Frightful happenings last night. Bullets flying outside the farmhouse. Found three of my twelve dogs dead this morning. Myriads of claw prints in the road. Human prints also. Probably Walter Brown's. Wire went dead as I phoned Brattleboro for more dogs. Later went by car. Bought four new dogs and several cases of rifle ammo. Phone company said the lineman found the cable cleanly cut at a point where it crossed the deserted hills north of Newfane. This is terribly frightening news. Surely you must inform the author authorities. Maybe if we can get them to believe your story, they could be of help. I know you've warned me to stay away, but maybe I could visit to help you explain your situation to the police. My corroboration might lend credence to your situation. The police will never believe any of this. I appreciate the offer, but there's nothing you can do. It would only hurt both of us. Are you sure? Do you have any family? Or a place you could stay in the meantime? You may be better off leaving Vermont entirely, I'm afraid. I was bewildered by your last email until I checked the history of our conversation. I never sent the last email you received, nor did I ever receive the message to which it seemed to reply. Things are much worse than we thought. If they keep tampering with our communications, I've changed my password, and you should do the same. I have a son in California. I'm arranging to go live with him, but... I've lived in this house my entire life. Maybe if I can prove to the aliens that I mean them no harm, and will explore no further, the situation will improve. This is certainly a distressing development. I changed my password and found no evidence of any tampering with my emails. Let me know if anything else happens. I will help you in any way I can. The next three messages came in quick succession, each arriving the morning after the last. Bad news. Last night was thickly cloudy, though no rain, and not a bit of moonlight got through. Things were pretty bad, and I think the end is getting near, in spite of our hopes. After midnight, something landed on the roof of the house. The dogs all rushed up to see what it was. One managed to get on the roof by jumping from the tree on the side of the house. There was a terrible fight up there, and I heard a frightful buzzing which I'll never forget. Then there was a shocking smell. Right then, bullets shattered the window and nearly grazed me. I put out the light and fired out the windows, raking all around the house with rifle fire aimed high enough to miss the dogs. Everything died down after that, but what, I, but what I found in the morning was terrible. Pools of blood were left in the yard, beside pools of a green sticky substance that smelled positively foul. I climbed on the roof and found more of the sticky stuff there. I still don't know what was up there. Five of the dogs were killed. One of them was shot in the back. I'm afraid I hit it by aiming too low. Now I'm replacing the panes the shots broke, and I'm off to Brattleboro for more dogs. Surely the men at the kennels think I'm crazy. I think I'll be ready to move in a week or two, 
but it kills me to think of it. Clouds didn't break, so no moon again. It's waning, anyway. I put in a damn searchlight if I didn't know they just cut the cables as fast as they could, as, as fast as they could be repaired again. I must be going crazy. They talked to me last night, in their cursed buzzing voices. I cannot repeat the things they told me over the barking of the dogs. Stay out of this, Wilmerth. It is worse than we ever suspected. They don't mean to let me leave Vermont. They wish to take me alive. Away, outside the galaxy. I told them I wouldn't go where they wish, or in the terrible way they wish to take me. But I fear it will be no use. Six more dogs killed. And I felt presences all along the wooded parts of the road when I drove to Brattleboro today. It is horrible. Don't get mixed up in this. The last email seemed more rushed than all the others. No use in discussing anything anymore. I am fully resigned. I have only enough willpower left to fight them off. Can't escape even if I were willing to leave everything and run. They'll get me. Had a letter from them yesterday. Posted on my front door. Walter Brown must have left it. The creatures couldn't have gotten so close with the dogs about. It tells what they want to do with me. Still cloudy nights, and the moon waning. I wish I dared to get help, but no one will believe me, and I'm too far out of touch. I have been for years. But the worst part is, I've seen and touched one of the things. God, it was awful. Dead, of course. One of the dogs had it. I found it near the kennel this morning. I tried to save it in the woodshed as evidence, but it all evaporated in a few hours. I tried to photograph it for you, but nothing was visible in the photos except for the woodshed. You know, those things in the rivers were only ever seen on the first morning after the flood. And explorers who saw figures in the woods always exclaimed it was difficult or impossible to take good pictures of them. It all makes sense now. How these things have stayed secret so long. This may be goodbye. If it is, please write my son. George Goodenow, Akeley, in 176 Pleasant Street, San Diego, California. But don't come up here. Write the boy if you don't hear from me in a week. And watch the papers for news. I'm going to play my last two cards now if I have the courage to. First, I will try poison gas on the things. I've got the chemicals and I've made masks for myself and the dogs. If that doesn't work, I will call the police. They may put me in a mental hospital, but it will be better than what the other creatures will do. I wish I hadn't become such a hermit. Folks don't drop around as they used to. Write my son if you don't hear soon. Don't mix up in this. Two days after reading Akeley's frantic last email, I received another one. Which is altogether shocking in this reversal of these sentiments which had characterized each of Akeley's past communications. Wilmerth. I must confess that I was entirely mistaken in my silly estimation of the Mego as our enemies. So much has changed in the last two days. We were correct in our speculations of the creature's existence and identity. But in believing they were malicious, we could not have been further from the truth. I already told you the aliens had attempted to communicate with me. Last night, I finally listened to what they had to say and allowed a human messenger of theirs to enter my home and explain their true intentions. Everything humans have ever conjectured of these things, from my own previous theories to the tales of the savage Indians, has been far off the mark. Our cultural background makes us, makes us humans simply unable to think in their terms. 
and what I thought was morbid and evil is in reality awesome, mind-expanding, and even glorious. It is simply man's tendency to shun the new and the different. Now I regret harming them so needlessly with my rifle fire. If only I had listened to them from the beginning, instead of initiating violence. But, thankfully, they bear me no grudge over their fallen. They do not feel emotions such as spite, malice, or revenge. In fact, the Migo have never willfully harmed any peaceful human. As I have learned, they are actually unjustly targeted by a cruel cult of humans who hunt and kill them on behalf of monstrous powers from other dimensions. It was these, the true villains, who stole the Black Stone and interfered with our communication. In reality, they want closer intellectual ties with humanity. They have so much to teach us and to learn from us. To this end, they have chosen me, me, to be their primary human interpreter. You may think me mad, but I wish to share with you the magnitude of the opportunity with which I am presented. I have already learned much of the Migo race and their alien culture. They communicate telepathically with one another, but through a routine surgery, they are able to form human speech as you have heard. They have mastered, mastered the discipline of surgery. Their science is far more advanced than ours, Wilmerth. They've answered many of my confusions of their anatomical composition. Their bodies are more vegetable than animal, though they are made of no such earthly materials. Our cameras cannot capture their image because the electrons composing their matter actually vibrate at a different frequency. It is unbelievable. Everything I've learned from them. There's so much more to tell, but it cannot be written in its entirety. You must come to visit me as soon as possible so we may discuss these incredible things in person. My house is no longer besieged. I have no more need of the dogs. It is entirely safe here now, and I take pleasure in rescinding my earlier warnings and extending to you my earnest invitation. I wish so badly to share this joy of discovery with you. Bring your laptop and the history of our communications. As much as you still have, we need all of it to retrace our steps and piece the whole remarkable story together. You can take the train to Brattleboro. I will meet you at the station whenever you find convenient. We can drive back to the farmhouse together. Prepare yourself to stay as long as possible, and for long nights of enlightening conversation. P.S. They have given me an incredible new device, which you will be amazed to see. My emotions after reading this new message were indescribable. I read it over and over again, marveling at the sudden turn of events, and hoping it to be true. Black terror converted at once to curiosity and excitement. If anything, the invitation to visit him in person and verify the truth of his words proved his authenticity. I replied to him that morning, and made my travel arrangements the next day. I set out three days later, taking my laptop, the tape cassette, and a suitcase of simple necessities. As agreed upon, I told no one of uh, no one else of my departure. No one else could understand the purpose of my venture, anyway. My train reached Greenfield seven minutes later, but the connecting northbound express had been held. I transferred in haste. When I disembarked the train in Vermont, I was finally struck by the great distance I had traveled from home. After coming out to the street, I scanned the line of cars, looking for the Akeley Ford. But before I could pick it out, I was approached by a man who asked if I was Mr. Wilmerth. Akeley has suffered a sudden asthma attack and couldn't make the trip, he explained. It isn't serious, and your visit should proceed just as planned. I'm Walter Brown and I'll be driving you to the farm, if you're ready now. I was shocked to learn the man's identity, but quickly overcame my puzzlement and entered the car to which he gestured. Of course Akeley must have reconciled with the man. 
Brown must have sensed my apprehension as we drove at first, in silence. He struck up a casual, a casual conversation after a while. At times, it seemed just the slightest bit as if he was pumping me to say, uh, pumping me to learn what I already knew about the Mego. There? You can see the farmhouse now. I'll have to go in ahead of you to let Akeley know you're here. He's been very eager to talk to you. When we arrived at the farmhouse, I immediately exited the vehicle to stretch my legs after the long ride. Brown went into the house to notify Akeley of my arrival as I stood and surveyed my surroundings, breathing in the fresh air. Sorry I can't stay any longer, Brown told me when he returned. I have important business elsewhere. Akeley is eager to see you, though. He's in bad shape today. When he has his attacks, he must talk in a whisper. His feet and ankles swell up, too. He has to bandage them. You can go right inside. He's in his study. The room on the left of the front hall. The blinds are shut. His eyes are very sensitive when he's ill, and he has to keep all the light out. Brown said his goodbyes, and drove off to the north. Okay. So he's had an asthma attack, but his like feet and ankles are bandaged, and we can't allow any light inside. And he has to speak in a whisper. Okay. Right. I can't wait to see how he's doing. What did uh, Akeley say about their capabilities of surgery again? When I reached the porch, I finally realized why the place seemed so strange to me. Since I had arrived, I had heard not a single sound, save my own footsteps and the noise of Walter Brown's car. Where were the farm animals? I overcame my misgivings and entered the farmhouse. I came to the door Brown had described to me, and took a breath before pushing it open. The room seemed to emanate a bizarre odor, and I perceived a faint sense of vibration from within. Akeley sat in a great armchair on the side of the room. He appeared sicker even than I had expected. His pale face held a strained, rigid expression. He greeted me in a faint whisper. Mr. Wilmoth, how marvelous to meet you for the first time in person. I'm very ill, and uh, I fear less than an able host. I'm sure I'll feel better tomorrow, but... For now, I'm hopelessly weak. I've set your dinner in the dining room. Your room is upstairs, just above this one. Make yourself at home and eat whatever you want. You might want to leave your laptop in here, where we'll be discussing our emails before you take your bag upstairs. Come back here for a little quiet visiting before night, and go to bed when you please. I'll rest here. Perhaps sleep here all night, as I often do. I hope you realize the stupendous nature of the opportunity we face. The gulfs of time, space, and knowledge beyond imagination will be open to us. They have promised to take me to their home planet, Yuggoth. You know it as Pluto. There are great cities on Yuggoth, with towers built of black stone, like the kind I tried to send to you. 
to visit Yuggoth would drive any weak man mad. But I am going there. You could too, Wilmarth. I left my laptop and the tape cassette in Akeley's study and went to eat my dinner. Then I moved my suitcase upstairs to my bedroom. I'm very slow at walking. Let's go upstairs. The whole time, I couldn't help but think of Akeley, sitting motionless in his study. Something in that whisper, I have to admit, filled me with a dislike for the sickly man. I have a feeling he's been, or is being, modified for his travels to Yuggoth. I was ashamed to feel this way, but I just wished he wouldn't speak such praises of Yuggoth and its black secrets. I soon rejoined the man to continue our conversation. Wilmoth, it is time I showed you the incredible device the Migo have given me. The Migo have discovered a harmless method to extract a brain. You preserve it in a canister made of metal from Yuggoth, while also preserving the life of the brain's host body. They give these disembodied brains sight, hearing, and speech through ingenious machines. They have given me one, and several such brain canisters to experiment with. I would like you to speak with another human, to begin with. Take the canister labeled B-67 and place it in the machine. Mr. Wilmerth, I hope I do not startle you. I am a human, just like you. My body now rests safely under vitalizing treatment inside Round Hill, about a mile from here. My brain is in that cylinder, and I see, hear, and speak through this machine. In a week, I will cross the void as I have many times, and I expect Akeley will accompany me. I hope you will also travel with us. I know you by sight, and reputation. I first met the Migo in the Himalayas, and since I became their ally, they have given me experiences few men will ever have. I have been to 37 different planets, Wilmerth. And all this has not harmed me in the least. My brain is virtually immortal in this canister. And my body never ages while I am outside of it. These visiting beings have methods which make the procedure easy and almost normal. It would be crude to call the operation surgery. The visitors are eager to know men of knowledge, such as yourself, and show them the great abysses of the universe. So I hope you will join us in our adventures. There is nothing to fear, but I will leave the matter up to you. Good night, Mr. Wilmerth, and treat our guest well, Mr. Akeley. If you don't mind, I think this will be the end of tonight's conversation. I wish to rest now, but we must continue our discussion in the morning. I was glad to be out of that study with the strange odor and vague suggestions of vibrations, yet could not escape a hideous sense of dread and peril as I thought of my situation. The wild, lonely region, 
the black, mysteriously forested slope towering so close behind the house. The footprints in the road. The sick, motionless whisper in the dark. The hellish cylinders and machines. Above all, the invitations to strange surgery and stranger voyagings. These things sapped my will and almost undermined my physical strength. One thing was certain. I would not spend another night here. I felt nothing now but fear and loathing, and I wished to escape this morbid place. Sleep would be impossible, I knew. I turned out the lights and fell into bed, fully dressed. Not a sound came from below, and I imagined my host sitting there with cadaverous stiffness in the dark. I can't remember how long my unexpected lapse into slumber lasted, and cannot be sure how much of the events that came next were sheer dream. Perhaps it was all a dream, to the moment when I rushed out of the house, stumbled to the shed, where I had seen the old Ford, and seized the ancient vehicle for a mad race over the haunted hills, arriving at last to the village of Townshend. When my frantic story sent a police unit out to the farmhouse, Akeley was gone, without a trace. The dogs and livestock were indeed missing, and there were some bullet holes. There were some curious bullet holes on the exterior of the house, and some walls within. There were no metal canisters, or machines, no laptop, no tape cassette, no odor or vibrations, no footprints in the road and none of the terrible objects I glimpsed in the very end. I stayed a week in Brattleboro after my escape, inquiring among people of every kind who had known Akeley. The results convinced me that the matter is no figment of dream or delusion. Akeley's purchase, purchases of dogs, ammunition, and chemicals, even the cutting of his telephone wires, are all matters of record. I learned that Round Hill was notoriously haunted, but could find no one who had closely explored it. Occasional disappearances of natives to the region were well attested, including Walter Brown, since the day I last saw him driving off. When I left Brattleboro, I resolved never to go back to Vermont for I know that loathsome outside influences must be lurking there in the half-unknown hills, and that those influences have spies and emissaries in the world of men. To keep as far from them as possible is all that I ask of life in the future. But I still have to tell the ending of that terrible night in the farmhouse. As I said, I finally dropped into a troubled doze, filled with terrible dreams of monstrous landscapes. I awoke to noises in the hall outside my door. Thankfully, the noises quickly ceased, and the footsteps went away. Later. I heard voices from the study below. There seemed to be several speakers, engaged in argument. Brought it on myself. Set the messages and the tape. Seeing and hearing. Damn you. Impersonal force after all. Fresh, shiny cylinder. Good God. Time we stop small and human brain saying harmless peace couple of weeks theatrical no reason original plan effects return soon round hill fresh cylinder 
Well, all yours. Down here, rest, place. Something in the fragmentary discourse chilled me immeasurably, raised the most grotesque and horrible doubts, made me wish I might wake up and prove it all a dream. But what about Akeley? Surely he would have protested if any harm were meant towards me. Yet, my instincts told me something was terribly wrong. I must talk to Akeley at once, I thought, and convince him to escape with me. They had hypnotized him with their promises of cosmic revelations, but now he must listen to reason. We would escape before it was too late. tiptoed down the creaking stairs to the lower hall, carrying my pocket flashlight in my right hand. Would to heaven I had quietly left the place before allowing the light to rest on the vacant chair in Akeley's study. Resting on the chair, I saw three objects, which the investigators did not find when they came later on. I hope devoutly that they were the waxen products of a master artist, despite what my innermost fears tell me. Great God, the whisperer in darkness, with its morbid odor and vibrations. For the things in the chair... Perfect to the last subtle detail of microscopic resemblance or identity. Were the face and hands of Henry Wentworth Akeley.